Hello and welcome. I'm Carolyn Griminger with the Public Affairs Forum of the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Austin. Our program's mission is to nourish mind and spirit and serve social justice. Our forums occur on most Sundays at noon and are free and open to the public. We encourage you to attend. Our church is physically located at 4700 Grover Avenue in Austin, Texas. For more information about our Public Affairs Forum, you can go to our church website at www.austinuu.org. At this time, I would like to introduce Dr. Amina Haji. Dr. Haji is a medical doctor, mother, and social justice advocate whose parents inspired her to devote herself to serving and healing her community. She founded Carisha Community and Austin Health Commons to put this mission into practice in Austin, which she has called home since 1999. Amina has long been called to work with a purpose. She grew up in Bryan, Texas, where her parents, Kareem and Asha Haji, started the first free medical clinic and served an ethic, ethnically and economically diverse community for 40 years. Both doctors themselves, Kareem and Asha, inspired Amina to create Karisha Community, which is named for them. After graduating from Pomona College with a bachelor's in psychobiology, Amina worked as a union organizer for several years and then spent a year traveling through East and South Africa and India. Eventually, the healing aspects of medicine drew her to Texas A&M, where she received her MD in 2001. Amina has spent most of her medical career practicing family medicine. She has also trained and served in diverse communities throughout the world, examining public health, healthcare systems, and learning how to meet the medical needs of vulnerable populations, such as Romani refugees in Macedonia and Aboriginal people in Australia. Amina is board certified in holistic and integrative medicine. In addition to her daily yoga practice, which she has maintained for 20 years, Amina co-founded a West African dance troupe with whom she performed for five years. While cultivating healing and community is Amina's life work, she also loves being a mom to her sweet son, Ayo, as well as Zen and Ami. Together, they enjoy biking around their neighborhood, playing music and dancing, and sharing food with family and friends. Amina is fluent in Spanish, in English. Let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Haji. Thank you all also for being here and receiving um, and being willing to learn about this vision to transform the culture of health and health care. So I'm going to begin by um, we're going to talk about both Carisha Community and Austin Health Commons, and I want to create sort of the space of community sharing that we create in this project, um, which is what really is the core of cultivating health and healing for ourselves as individuals and for ourselves in community. Carisha Community is a project in construction. It's a 14,000 square foot health and healing center that we're building in Central East Austin, which will have a teaching kitchen, a mind-body center, primary care, and urgent care, where there's medical doctors like myself practicing with acupuncturists, massage therapists, practitioners, um, yoga therapists, all kinds of practitioners in one space where then you can be guided to receive the kind of care that empowers you to be well. Um, so that's Carisha Community. As we were creating that and creating a sustainable model to share with other physicians to create collaborative um, centers in healthcare, it's a sustainable, replicable model, we realized I'd love to invite you to come up here so uh, you can have, and maybe Shernaz, I'm going to have you give one of those touchstones. We realized as we were creating this vision, I cannot do this as a medical doctor. I also can't even do it myself with my incredible collaborative of holistic and integrative practitioners. Who was missing is you, who's here, listening, watching, and, um, and participating. So um, what, that's where the Austin Health Commons was born. The Austin Health Commons is you and me. 
It's a community trust. It's a nonprofit which supports our community's innate capacity to heal. And we've been challenged to think about, well, what's needed? It's to, uh, for our community to heal, but also for our community to own our own health and health care. So it's challenged us to think about what do we need to own our health care and what do we need to heal? Well, to own our own health care, we've uh, come up with some structures where Austin Health Commons, our nonprofit, you and me, will own Carisha, a profitable health center, so that the profits of health care no longer flow to the big dollar heads of health care corporations. The profits of health care flow back to us to then determine where health needs are. And then what does our community need to heal? We need to look at truths of the 1928 master plan, the founding of this country that was on slavery, on genocide, um, and displacement. And that has to heal before we can really have healing and transform in our community. So that's what the Austin Health Commons does. Now, how do we do it? Um, you will find on your seat these touchstones. We learned these touchstones from Dr. Gail Christopher, uh, who was with the Kellogg Foundation and is the architect of Truth Racial Healing Transformation. I'm going to invite you um, to kind of just look over these touchstones and um, and actually what we usually do is, you have the mic, right? First, what I'd like to do is just if you'd be willing, share your name and one thing that you're grateful for. And I will begin by saying my name is Amina Haji. I am grateful for being able to be in community and share this vision and create health and So I'd like to go second myself. I um, was telling Dr. Haji at the beginning, I know I need healing, and, and I'm grateful because I'm five years out from breast cancer, and I no longer have to take my daily medication. So I'm grateful. <laughs> I forgot to mention that in uh, these safe spaces we create, if you hear something that resonates with you, feel free to snap. <laughs> Okay. The next person to share your name and one thing you're grateful I, I, for. I'm Edward Under, Underhill, and I'm grateful that I, I will be able to. I will be able to ask a question that I would like to ask. <laughs> you're grateful that you'll be able to ask a question. Is that right? Just go ahead and pass the microphone. I'm Lisa Brown, and I'm grateful to learn about this work. I'm Judy Sedgwick. I'm really grateful for my family today. Hold on. I'm uh, Marina Vasquez, and I'm really grateful for my friends. I'll get it. I'm George. Let's talk about it. I'm George Garcia, and I'm grateful to be here. I'm grateful for my health. I'm Sharon Ask Garcia, and I'm particularly grateful this week for some healing that I have experienced. I'm Elizabeth Kabala, and I am grateful to be able, body, and healthy. Thank you for sharing what you're grateful for. Um, it always seems to be um, those who we love and the opportunities and gifts that life presents us with. So you will find touchstones. Um, the touchstones are what we use to create agreements so that we create safe spaces. Um, Lisa, could you possibly pass one back to Marina so she has one? I'm gonna ask that we um, just speak in to some ways that we can be together today. Um, and if one of these resonates with you, I'm gonna ask you to just read it. That means you'll have to be walking around again. I'm making you get your exercise. So I would say, I can read one, speak your truth, say what's in your heart, trusting that your voice will be heard and your contribution respected. Your truth may be different from even the opposite of what another in the circle has said. Speaking your truth is not debating with, correcting, or interpreting what another has said. Own your truth by speaking only for yourself using I statements. I'd like to read the no fixing. 
Each of us is here to journey, our, each of us is here to discover our own truths, to listen to our own inner teacher, and to take our own inner journey. We are not here to set someone else straight or to help right another's wrong, to fix or correct what we perceive as broken or incorrect in another member of the group. If you have one you want to read, yep, just ask for the mic. Be 100% present, extending and presuming welcome. Set aside the usual distractions of things undone from yesterday, things to do tomorrow. Bring all of yourself to the work. We all learn most effectively in spaces that welcome us. Welcome others to this place and this work and presume that you are welcomed. I've been told we need more of the handouts, so if you have three, we need three more. You can share one. Four, two. Yeah. You can share. Okay. I don't think so you need one. Listen intently, listen deeply, listen intently to what is said, listen to the feelings beneath the words, to listen another soul, another soul into life, into a condition of disclosure and discovery may be almost the greatest service that any human being ever performs for another. Listen to yourself also, strive to achieve a balance between listening and reflecting speaking and acting. Identify assumptions. Our assumptions are usually invisible to us, yet they undergird our worldview and thus our decisions and our actions. By identifying our assumptions, we can then set them aside and open our viewpoints to greater possibilities. Respect silence. Silence is a rare gift in our busy world. After you or another has spoken, take time to reflect and fully listen without immediately filling the space with words. When things get difficult, turn to wonder. If you find yourself disagreeing with another, becoming judgmental, shutting down in defense, try turning to wonder. I wonder what brought her to this place. I wonder what my reaction teaches me. I wonder what he's feeling right now. Um, maintain confidentiality. Create a safe space by respecting the confidential nature and content of discussions held in our circle. What's said in our circle remains here except if there's information about health problems that you wish to share, please share it. <laughs> Keep the personal things shared to yourself. Um, I'm gonna invite us, if it's okay with you, to absorb and take those touchstones for a moment. Uh, Carolyn, we're gonna have one more very short round of sharing. Um, before that, if it's okay with you, I'd like to center us I feel like when we just close our eyes and breathe or leave our eyes open and breathe, we are often able to um, focus our mind on what we're here for. So if you would oblige, would that be okay with everybody? Would those touchstones be okay with everybody? Or does anyone have anything they'd like to add? That works. Okay, so I'm just gonna invite you to keep your eyes open or closed. Just sit comfortably in your chair or wherever you are. Take a slow, deep breath. Just fill your lungs from bottom to middle to top with fresh oxygen, with fresh vital air. And just exhale, releasing any stale air, stale thoughts, anything you don't need right now. Take another slow, deep breath. Just allow that fresh air and fresh oxygen to circulate from your head to your face, your shoulders, your arms, your chest, your back, your tummy, your hips, your legs, and let each of those parts of your body relax 
and release as you exhale. Take another slow, deep breath. Bring your attention to your heart center, the place from which we feel gratitude, connection, and purpose. That's also the place from which your own light can shine. And allow that light to shine into this space today, into this time together. Bring your mind's eye to a candle, the light that you are. And just see how when you take a candle and you bring it next to another candle, how the flame grows. And if you bring it next to another candle and another candle, the flame grows even bigger. So feel free to light your light, hold your candle and bring it together in this space because it's through community that we will transform the culture of health and health care that we will heal as individuals and that we will heal in community. Whenever you're ready, just keep your attention to your heart center. Keep your slow, steady breaths. See if your body might be a little more relaxed and released so you can bring your full self together. Whenever you're ready, just come right back into this space together. On this next round of sharing, I'd like to hear from each one of you very briefly, what does health look like for you? And if it's okay, we'll just go as though we were in a circle or in some order. And if you don't feel like sharing, you can always pass the mic. It's not obligatory. So tell us what health looks I like. Think, to you. I think the word might be shibboleth. It's something you can't, you're not allowed to deny the value of, mm -hmm. either for good or ill. So it's like, it's suspicious in that, for that reason. I don't know what to say. I think that what came to mind is breath flowing through the body. Uh, that's uh, the essential component of health or an essential component of health. For me, the way health looks like is being able to wake up in the morning and the body feels good, like ready to go without uh, aches. freedom and the liberation that comes from knowing that you don't have any illness, that you, you know, that you're, don't have any illness and they weigh you down. I think my, my understanding of health is evolving, but um, at the moment I thinking that it's really a sense of well-being um, that brings together the whole mind, body, and spirit because I'm discovering that when my spirit is not in a good place, that my body isn't either. Uh, was there a really hard question that I'd like to think about for longer, but um, I should have warned you you would get this question. I'm sorry. I'm also learning. Um, I think I would add, like, I like what everybody has said, but, like, there's a piece of it that has to do with our environment and our community, and um, so we can't really be healthy unless we have a healthy environment and a healthy community. I think at this point, um, it's to me, it's mobility and being able to do the things I want to do. I keep thinking about my heart, having an open heart, and um, not shallow breathing, but deep breathing, and um, my feet on the ground, and just a sense of confidence. I think of um, peace of mind and gratitude. I think of 
being well, <clears throat> radiance, glowing of a sense of positive presence. And everything's working enough to sing. The body is singing. Body Thank you. Those are beautiful and very full um, ideas of what health is and what health looks like. I'm going to share only two statistics when I speak with you today, but I'm going to share one right now. And then I'm going to share Carisha and Health Commons as a story. I'm going to tell you my story and how I came to create this vision with you to transform the culture of health and healthcare. And the reason I'm going to share my story is because each of us has a story. And it is through the stories of our lives that we ever grow, evolve, unfold, and create and envision what needs to be there. And I'm hoping there's threads in your own life and your own story which connect. So I heard that health is um, community. I heard it's our environment. I heard it's radiance. I heard it's body, mind, and spirit. I heard mobility. I heard all of these things. And a problem we have in our healthcare system right now is it only tends to speak to our bodies, right? And there's a statistic from the World Health Organization that only 11, if you look at a pie, one little slice of the pie, 11% of our health outcomes are determined by clinical care by really what 99% of our allopathic healthcare system is, only determines 11% of health outcomes. The other 89% is everything you all just said. It's community, it's environment, it's your social support, it's your connection to your spirit. Um, and so this vision is one to create a health center that reflects all of those elements of health and while the health center can only do so much of that, it's nested in a community which supports the other 89%. So I'm going to start with my story. I'm a fourth generation physician. My grandmother was a physician in India in the 1930s, not very common as you could imagine. Then she was a freedom fighter with Mahatma Gandhi for the independence of India. And after that, she spent the last 30 years of her life in an ashram in the Himalayas, where I got to grow up going. And I very much see my life and my story as a culmination of social justice, health, and spirituality. My mom and dad, as Carolyn shared, were both physicians in Bryan, Texas. They were the first physicians in our town, or the, sorry, the only physicians in our town to take Medicaid patients back in the 1970s in small town Bryan, Texas. Um, what I remember is they had some of the most diverse spaces that you could find in Bryan because they're, as you know, in most of the U.S. and particularly the South, there's a railroad track that divides brown and white. There's a highway. We have I-35 that divided white and brown. So in Bryan, there weren't very many mixed spaces, but my parents' uh, reception area of their clinic was one of the most diverse spaces I would see. But one thing I also noticed was that the people who had more resources, often white professionals, would complain and say to my parents, I don't want to be in this waiting room with those people. And they were pointing to mostly black and brown people who had fewer economic resources because of the systemic inequities that have been built in that with the foundings of our nation. So that to me taught me, all right, so it's not just that we have to create structures and systems to put people that look different than one another in the same spaces, but we have to cultivate connections, shared understandings, and that's where the health commons concept is. I was really lucky because my mom did yoga when I was growing up. So when I was about six, I wanted to be near her and that's when I learned to do yoga. Our culture, uh, Ayurveda, which is the science of life, it's a traditional system of medicine in India, teaches food as medicine. So when I traveled in India, 
there would be people with a second grade education that knew this spice is cleansing, this spice is digestive, this spice is carminative, so it is transmitted through the culture that your food is your medicine. Fast forward 20 or 30 years, I was shocked in medical school that that's not how health is viewed. I grew up seeing a sense of balance, it's your food, it's how you feel, it's your daily life, what you do from morning till when you go to sleep. Um, and going to medical school, I was very shocked. Um, it, it's reductionistic, right? It's not relationship-based. I was taught if somebody has back pain, well, ask them some few questions, uh, do an exam, uh, check their reflexes, but we wouldn't even ask, well, where are you sleeping and what kind of mattress are you on? Or, you know, do you have young kids that you're lifting, right? We forget sometimes the, the obvious things. The other thing that concerned me and surprised me when I went to medical school, only having seen what I grew up with, I call what my parents did something called conscious health care. And what I mean by that is, and this is what my generations did back in India, all the doctors in my family trusted, they are cared for, there is enough money to be made, that if they serve, and they serve all, it will work. Now they never did a, a financial model, in this day and age we're intentionally financially modeling conscious health care where those who have more resources <coughs> enable those who have been systematically denied resources to partake in the same kind of care. So when I went, having seen what I call conscious health care, in medical school and residency, I did my training up at Scott and White in Temple. If a white male came in with a business suit, the subtle messaging and what I learned from my attendings was give him everything he wants, every test he wants, uh, every study he wants. It, it generated revenue for the hospital system. Um, and we weren't always doing what was in the best interest of this person. Um, sometimes we, the tests aren't going to give us the answers. And on the other hand, I remember so clearly a patient who was alcoholic. He had cirrhosis, he uh, wasn't so well, and he had been drinking, and he got sick, and he was in the hospital. The message to me was, patch him up and get him out. He is wasting our resources. And this is the perspective, based on the way our healthcare system is set up and the incentivization around doing procedures and not about being well. So it was clear to me, we can do much better than this. We can create a healthcare system that's based on our shared humanity, where the incentivization, it's a membership-based model that also takes health insurance that we're creating through Carisha where the incentives are to be well, even if you have physical illnesses, you can be well. And that it's also uh, respecting a shared humanity and cultivating that understanding where sometimes we have blind spots. So I did my residency at Brackenridge Hospital before the one that is now um, has just been closed. Um, and I decided to start creating the vision for what we're doing. I started uh, connecting um, people and resources and talking about this vision. Uh, I did the startup on Austin Resource for the Homeless Clinic. Um, I worked for several years, about seven years at Community Care, where I was able to see some sense of medical doctors with pharmacists, with nutritionists. But what I wasn't seeing yet is real teams. A lot of times the medical doctors we are not trained to have relationship-based care. We're not trained to ask questions about your life. And so a lot of times our medical doctors in these clinics where there were other practitioners weren't even referring to the mental health practitioner. The mental health practitioner had no patients to see all day and I know there were people that had mental health needs. So our training and our mindset is not such that there are many aspects of care that are valuable. So I was learning as I was in practice for the last 20 years here in Austin, Texas, in Central East Austin, um, what we needed to do to make this different. 
I'm going to pass a few things around as I go, just so you get a touch, taste, and feel of what we're doing. So we've created a guest assessment wheel. Um, what this is, is it, when you go see your doctor at Carisha, you will have to think about how are you doing on your purpose in life? Do you feel a good sense of purpose right on a scale of zero to 10? How about your creativity? Um, how creative are you? How about your financial stability, your vocation, your education, your physical health? Then there's social supports and there's 12 spokes on the wheel and your physical health is only one of them. And so then what we do is we map this. It will be a circle. You will be able to see which parts of your life are more full, which parts of your life are needing support. And I, as a doctor, might recommend, oh, your financial stability isn't great. Okay, well, I have a financial advisor who will see you on a sliding scale and can help you with that. So we begin to connect all the parts of your life with your care. And I can also pass another one that way if anybody wants it. Um, so through these experiences of clinical practice is how we began to create new models of care. Um, I also was visiting integrative health centers around the country to look at best practices. What I learned was that most integrative, if you are familiar with integrative, raise your hand and if you're not, or so let's say this, if you've heard the word, if you've not heard the word or you're not familiar with the word integrative, would you just raise your hand so I know? Um, so integrative tends to mean we draw from many traditions to care for, uh, to bring health. Um, integrative does not mean collaborative, because collaborative means it takes more than one doctor, that it takes a team of nutritionists and chiropractors, acupuncturists, all kinds of people because everybody's different. Um, so I went to integrative centers around the country. What I learned was that these are taking place in large hospital systems and in academic centers like the Osher Center in San Francisco or University of Arizona. Um, they're not running in the black, they're running in the red. So it's not when I, a physician in Austin, Texas, want to start a little center that I can serve you in this way, uh, I didn't have a business model. And when I asked for the financial model when I went to visit centers, I was told, well, we can't share that information. And I thought, but if we're doing this to promote health and create new models for health, we need to share the model. If I'm going to take my life and create this, then I want to share it with other physicians and healthcare practitioners. So that was where this vision was born, that we're creating Carisha Community, nested in a health commons, that's then a sustainable model for other doctors to create collaborative practices in conscious healthcare to serve and then to replicate more of these around the country. Um, so we actually, as we were starting, we launched something called the Next Center. We started sharing with a couple of other physicians as Carisha was under construction to create, one was a cancer doctor, one was a functional doctor to create <coughs> integrative centers of uh, conscious health care. That was when I learned it's not going to be me and a team of consultants that can change how cancer care is delivered or the mindset of who needs this kind of care, right? And that was when we created the Austin Health Commons. So we launched the Health Commons in 2017. We brought out John Katowicz of Cutting Edge Capital and Jamie Harvey with the Institute for a Sustainable Future. And we borrowed from a model called the Food Commons in Fresno, California. Now, in Fresno, they are working to create a local food system. So, what does that look like? There's a nonprofit trust, it's called the Food Commons, and that's kind of why we're called the Health Commons. So, the Food Commons owns a, a public benefit corporation, uh, which is uh, harvests the food on the land, it distributes the food locally, it pays workers ethically, it's vertically integrated. So, the Commons owns a company and makes food distribution local. And that's sort of the concept here. So we said, this is great. That first year when we launched, we still were not, we were bringing in people who were white, Asian, 
professionals. We still were not representing the community that we serve. And how do we know the community that we serve? What we, this model is what we call a place-based model. So in any conscious health care center, we believe you demographically survey the, my, the radius around you. So Carisha, we've surveyed the three mile radius around us and we know that in that area, it is half female, half male. Um, it is about 47% Latino. It's actually 23% black. It will change just a little bit to 18% black. Um, and it's 22% white, 28% white is where it's headed. Now this is for the Carisha Center, so we felt like, okay, we have to look more like who we're going to serve, because how can you be accessible if you don't? And that's a problem with accessibility in our day and age. So um, that's when we brought Dr. Gail Christopher last year to begin Truth Racial Healing Transformation. These are racial healing circles, and I want to share with you and invite you to be a part of this work of what we call Root Cause Community Healing. What we do in these is we create safe spaces and invite people who are normally separated in society. So because of I-35, you will have generations of people growing up black and brown on the east side, perhaps now moving to Pflugerville, to Maine, or to Del Valley, who are not in everyday interactions, nor on corporate boards or nonprofit boards, or even in the same schools with people who are living on the west side, off of Lamar, and in the hills, and in Westlake, there's so much separation. So people don't know one another's experiences, and often we can stay in, sort of on one side there's collective trauma, meaning over generations, there's systemic inequities, and people don't have the same access to resources, but on the other side of town, there's sort of collective amnesia, life is good or maybe life isn't good but the perspective is lost right and so we create safe spaces for people to share and come to recognize a shared humanity as opposed to um, an otherness that has created a believed hierarchy in human value and that is subtle it's not always obvious but it's there <clears throat> truth racial healing transformation is just one part of root cause community healing. There are many trainings. As you know, the mayor's office has, um, the mayor created a task force on institutionalized racism and systemic inequities, and they've chosen Beyond Diversity as a training. We now have 1,500 Austinites that have undergone Beyond Diversity. It's a small army. We've, ACC, Dr. Holly was here to speak with y'all, I know. they created the Truth Racial Healing Transformation Program and they have done lots of racial healing circles. There's Undoing Racism Austin. So there's about 2,000, 2,500 people in Austin who have attended these time intensive trainings and learning. And one of the things we are doing that I want to invite you to be a part of, we're launching a campaign called Austin is Healing. And what we're doing is we are saying we as community need to come together and those of us who have the resources will support this vision. We don't want to become a nonprofit that is chasing after foundation money. We want this to be self-sustaining because we know in five years, once Carisha is built and Carisha is profitable, Carisha will be owned by the health commons and will support our racial healing. And in the interim, we're inviting our own community to serve as sustaining donors. And then we are collaborating and coordinating and convening the Mayor's Task Force, the City of Austin Equity Office, the ACC Equity Office, and many other nonprofits and other organizations to create a collective and collaborative vision for racial equity and healing in Austin. So that is one invitation um, at the end, I will pass something around if you're interested. Um, in case you're watching or listening, you can write to Austin Health Commons, just Austin Health Commons at gmail.com is how you can sign up or just let us know. Um, 
We also have an opportunity for you to participate in a racial healing circle. Next Saturday, today is actually the last day of registration for next Saturday's racial healing circles. If you have attended one, there are many people who attend more than one because we deepen every time. So on Saturday, May 11th, we're partnering with the YMCA of Austin and we're holding racial healing circles for, I think in the afternoon. You do have to register. It's free if you have if you need to make it free, you can donate $5, $100, whatever you think it's worth it. Um, but there's no payment required. And um, the registration closes this evening. I am grateful to be able to share this vision to transform the culture of health and health care through the Carisha Clinic, which is this. I will pass this around. We are shifting from sick care, where it's a pill for every ill, to health care, where health is embodied there. And with the health commons, we're shifting from ownership of health, from being corporations, to being community, me and you. And we're cultivating root cause community healing. If you'd like to be a part, again, our website for Carisha, can I mention that? www.carisha.org. Um, and then the website for the Health Commons is www.austinhealthcommons.org. And then I'll just say one more time, the email is austinhealthcommons at gmail.com. Um, I'm going to pass around a sign-in if you want to receive our updates um, and invitations, then just make sure we have your name and information. Um, I would like to open this up for questions. Okay, we have about 17 minutes left for our question and answer. I can bring you the microphone. Make sure you speak directly into the microphone as we're taping. Thank you for being here and sharing this. Thank you. Your vision of healthcare healing. Tell us a little bit more about Carisha and what the function of the uh, health functioning of it is. I mean, if it's not a pill for every ill, what is it? What goes on there in terms of a patient a health provider relationship? Can you share some of that with us? Absolutely. Thank you for asking. Um, isn't it amazing that it's hard for us to conceptualize what a pill, what is it if it's not a pill for every ill? Um, so, in Ecaricia, you would establish primary care with a medical doctor because we believe there needs to be some stewardship and guidance, right? So, I, uh, I know you are very radiant and I'm going to hypothetically say you have hypertension. Okay? And then, you may not, I hope you don't, but let's just hypothetically say. And you said, Doc, I have hypertension, I've been on this medicine for 40 years, my blood pressure's, you know, just starting to edge up a little bit, I really don't want to have to take another medication, what could we do? So I'm going to say, great, um, tell me a little about yourself, tell me about your life, what do you do in your life, what gives you meaning in your life, I'll have you fill out the the wheel, right? And then when we look at it, uh, we might find that uh, you have a job that's creating some stress and there were some changes in the market that impacted your retirement, so there's some financial stressors. Um, and then I might be able to say, well look, you told me you don't want more medication, you can stay right where you're at and maybe I can plug you into some um, meditation, or I could plug you into some Tai Chi. We could try this for six weeks and then you come back and see me and see if it's working. If you don't like it, well, there are lots of other resources. And as for your, the retirement issues, financial stressors are real, then I can ask you, do you have somebody to help you with that? If not, let's see if somebody on our team can link you up with somebody. So it's, for one, it's a mindset of our practitioners. 
Uh, it is also, I'm going to pass this around so you can see. This is our 3D renderings of the health center and, and the spaces in it. And then it has a lot of modules. So you'll see that in our operations model, like I mentioned, there's primary care, there's a teaching kitchen, there's things that herbs and yoga mats and heating pads and things we can sell. There's a mind-body center. I'll share this so you get a sense of the practitioners and the operations that are there. Does that help give you an idea of what I'm talking about? Sure, it's very holistic. Yeah, it's holistic, correct. It's sustainably holistic. Correct, correct. Thank you. So I have personal experience with this. Um, I've had various ailments, and one I can think of that's pretty simple is my knee just like seemed to stop working. So I went the Western medication route, right? I went to physical, well first they put me on muscle relaxers, then they sent me to physical therapy, but I did not feel hurt, right? They definitely didn't ask me all these various questions about my life. And then um, it turned out that all it was while well, I was sitting wrong in my chair. <laughs> wow. Right. So that's just one. And then I'm sure a lot of people have been touched by diabetes. A, a dear friend, family member, was recently diagnosed. Um, he had to be put in intensive care, almost passed away. Um, they still don't really know what's going on. So I'm thinking, they're not, I know they're not doing this. So I really see the value in helping a person balance their life, mm -hmm. you know? But yeah. it would seem like it would take a patient um, would really need to be humble. You know, because a lot of us are just conditioned, like, give me a pill, you know, give me whatever, and make do all these pills in it and change your diet and all that. But I know there's lifestyle issues. Mm -hmm. Well, stress, you know, stress mm -hmm. is such a, a major thing, I think, with all of these. Mm -hmm. The mind is a powerful tool. Um, there's a few things you said that are so key about what we're doing. Um, in what I shared, there's a guest navigation tree. There's um, a lot of pages in there, but... The guest navigation tree is something that when you come into Carisha, you're going to be able to see. And it shows you yourself as a tree and where we're used to operating versus how you can get to the root causes of things. Meaning, if you're a tree and you break your limb, well, you need an orthopedic doctor. And that's sort of like in the trunk of the limb. Um, if you have a wound or a sore, well, you might need a doctor for antibiotics. You may or may not. You might need physical therapy for wound care. But then you might ask yourself, well, why did I fall? You know, do, was something in my home? Or is my life chaotic and hurried and I, you know, I was going too fast in my trip? Or you may say, why did I get a wound in the first place? Like, what's, is there some imbalance in my body? And that's when you want to get into the roots. And on our guest navigation tree, it shows you how do you get to the roots? There's life coaching, there's naturopathy, there's many different modalities that are more root cause oriented, functional medicine. And though what's relevant to what you said, Carolyn, is that we are used to the pill for the ill and we're used to staying at the trunk, which is much faster. In the short run, it's cheaper and it takes less investment of time but it allows things to simmer and get worse because we're just treating the symptoms. So for those who are wanting to, there's the root, but it takes longer. And we have to change our mindset that it does take longer, but the healing is more full. Because what we're aiming for is what I heard, mind and body connected to spirit, being radiant, being full in our lives and being mobile. So it takes longer, and you're absolutely right. Um, it takes uh, more time, and that's where the community matters, because we all have to encourage each other. Usually, these we're sitting in a circle, and when we sit in a circle, there's a lot of power there to support one another in things that take more time. And as we started out, um, establishing trust, you know, Establishing trust. So you have to have that rapport with your healthcare provider or whoever it is to really talk about these deep things too. And I think a lot of us, I know I don't trust doctors. Yeah. So I just want to get well, I want out of there, you know, as quick as possible. So this Carisha community sounds wonderful because it really sounds like you're establishing a place of trust. Yeah, and I think part of trust is us as doctors acknowledging how 
how this health system has been and that there's there hasn't been trust. So being open to hearing that. Um, I think there's one, one another question. Thank you, Amina, for uh, really um, illustrating your vision and sharing it with us. I'm wondering, what are your thoughts about how to bring other physicians and other components of the traditional healthcare system into this model, given how entrenched it is, given, given the deep roots, I guess, to use your analogy. Um, how, do we, how, do we, how does any community create that shift uh, at, a at a level that's transformative for the whole, whole community, not just a few people at a time? Thank you for asking that. I'm going to ask you to problem solve that with me because I do believe it takes a village. Um, so for one, we're, we are blessed that in Austin we have Del Med, whose vision is to transform medical education. And there's always pushing of boundaries that can still happen. Racial equity is just becoming something they're thinking about. It's not necessarily collaborative, but, but Dean, um, the dean there is very forward thinking. Um, and it is, physicians, I would say, are the most difficult group to bring along into this vision because we really are trained to believe we have all the answers. The other problem is we don't, in our conscious healthcare paradigm, one of the components is self-care and development of self. Development of self means looking at ourselves, being vulnerable, and what do I need to learn? And we're not taught that. We're taught to have a shell, right? And we're not taught to say, I'm not sure. Let me think about that. I'm not sure. Do you have ideas? Um, so physicians are the, one of the most challenging groups. Um, on the other hand, I founded a group called the Integrative Providers of Austin about four or five years ago, which now two of my colleagues, Julie Reardon and Darshan Shah, lead. And that has grown to about 100 physicians in town who are inter interested in integrative care. So in Austin, we're lucky. A lot of them moved from outside Austin. And with the migration, net migration in, we have more people that are more open. That said, it is the reason we form the Austin Health Commons. I really believe that as community holds this vision and community speaks in and has a voice to say, healthcare is not working for us. We do need healthcare to be different. And then that requires the support of this vision. It does require financial support. There are work groups. Sometimes we ask for volunteers from the community to come help us design our operations. Or there's many ways, but that is also why. So that we're creating change from the inside, and then we're also bringing in change from the outside, and ultimately the outside and inside are one and no different. This is all really super inspiring. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. I'm wondering, so I hear that if somebody comes in with a physical ailment, then kind of everything is looked at. Um, what? Are, are you set up so that people could come in with, say, they want financial help from the, like that's what they start out with, or they want mental health care to begin with, as opposed to coming in with some kind of physical condition? That is a fantastic question. Yes. <laughs> I will say not yet and yes. The financial, no. There are definitely resources in town where you can go for financial support. We won't yet have the capacity to be, um, if you look at that guest assessment wheel, to provide each and every service that people could need. So that one, it's more that we can connect people into the resources like a web using our co community collaborators. Now mental health, absolutely. If you uh, need a counselor, you can walk in and ask for a counselor. Um, if you um, need a chiropractor, you can come in and see a chiropractor. Now, it's important to know that this is a model we're just creating. It's a membership-based model, and we really believe we have to create sort of a, 
a system where you buy into this. So there's going to be a point at when we first open our doors, which is going to be in 2021, we're going to have a lot more open access. But as our memberships fill, we're going to have to make sure that we have enough capacity for the members and that we may have some ability to serve people walking in for things and there will be other things that are for once you've become a member. And then what we want is we don't want an infinite growth model. We don't want to become sprout up an urgent care here and an urgent care there and a primary care because then we're not embedded and connected in community. So then we want other conscious health care centers that are place-based to sprout up when our memberships are full. Um, but yes, you can walk in for the number of different services that are there because there are many paths of entry and that's how we respect you as an individual. So can you explain like today, like if we wanted to join today, what would we do? This is a great question. What we have that you can join today is Austin is Healing, the campaign, the sustaining donorship, which creates all of this. And that is something that it's a $5 a month, it's a $1 a month, it's a $100 a month, whatever your means <coughs> are to support this movement. The memberships to Carisha to um, receive health care there, in addition to you can use your insurance, those will launch next summer. So for that, we just have to ask you to, uh, if, you're, if you've got a sign in, make sure we have your email. Um, if you're listening, then make sure you email us at, at austinhealthcommons. What did I say? I think I gave um, a different one, but it does work if you email austinhealthcommons at gmail.com. I gave, that's a, we have a better email address, but we'll keep going with that one. So that will launch next summer. There should be a whole lot of interest about this in the community. I, I know I'm definitely interested, and I think a lot of people in this room are too. I believe so, because I believe it's just common sense health care. There's actually statistics that support one in seven people in the U.S. meditate, one in nine practice yoga, two-thirds use some form of alternative and, well, what's called alternative, we're making it part of um, real health care, two-thirds use things that are other than allopathic medical doctors, so we're hoping to just make health care common sense and practical. Okay, we're out of time. Thank you very much for coming today. Thank you. Appreciate it.